Derek? Is that your? Hey, Phil, how are you, sir? Is that your home shop or is that your real shop? What's that? A home shop. Okay, wow. Uh, just uh, just down here in the basement and uh, up here. Hello from Canada. Hello from Canada. Good, awesome. Hey, how's uh? Where? Yeah. Do, do I see? Where are you in Canada? Uh, Ancaster, just outside of uh, Hamilton, uh, the Toronto, just uh, I guess technically west of Toronto. Uh, okay, I'm a hundred clicks east of Toronto. Oh, wow. oh good show. Neighbors. <laughs> Neighbors. Very nice. You betcha. Looks like I can see a Gerstner in the background there. Two of them. Uh, yes. Yeah, that could Two be. Of Two of them. Um, Is that one leather covered? Is that the leather one? I'm a. Or no, I did a rebuild on it, okay. and um, my wife thought it would look good in a um, uh, with red felt and uh, cappuccino. So, um, yeah. so that's what I did. And then the other one this summer coming, uh, we'll we'll do a rebuild on it. But um, uh, shop's a mess. My apologies. That's um, that's but a, um, nice to see it. You know, uh, yeah, I did a rebuild a couple of years ago on a Gerstner. I like the red felt. It is kind of sharp. Uh, and that's what I think I'll do with the uh, with the, the the darker or sorry the brown wood. I'll do with the red, and then um, uh, but but keep it uh, the same color and not touch any of the brass or anything because it's uh, it belonged to uh, an old machinist uh, and I was uh, just fortunate to uh, to come across it. So um, it's, got a, it's got a lot of history. Did you uh, buy your felt right from Gerstner, or did you buy your own felt? I actually made the mistake of buying it directly from Gerstner and then I returned it. Really? Um, because um, I, it wasn't as good as some of the stuff I could get. And and looking back at the uh, the costs associated with shipping it back, I, I'd well, have been smart just to hang on to it. But um, really? so, um, tell me where, because when I do this, I, I've, I've got a, a box at work I've, I restored back in the 80s. It's about ready for one. Where'd you get your felt? What's, what's the best felt to get? Uh, I got it at Fabricland uh, here. In, I don't know if you guys have the same Fabricland up here in Canada. Uh, and it was a really nice weight uh, felt, and um, uh, and about half the cost of what Ger uh, what Gersner wanted for it directly. Does it have uh, the only on thing? It? Does it have what's right? Like a backing on it? No, it's just straight felt, oh. and um, and I just uh, I just go glue it in with a, a 3M spray adhesive and it uh, goes in nicely um the only thing is you'll see it doesn't have the um uh the the logo the little right. label was missing so i did get that from Kersner. Okay. um this this box the the darker one i uh, i bought the key lock oh. and the um and the key set so it um uh in order to keep it all original very nice very nice the only problem with that glue yeah. is Boy, when I was done with my last box, my fingers were stuck together for three <laughs> nights. I mean, that the the, 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 the spring was, yep, yeah. <laughs> was great, but hey, Frank. Yep. How are you doing, Frank? All right. Uh, so what I'm going to do is get the show started here. Uh, I'm going to share my screen. Uh, I'm also going to uh, probably mute everybody. All right. So what I've done tonight, though, uh, for your benefit. I've numbered all the slides, and uh, if a, a particular slide doesn't have a number on it, it's because I made a change, and for whatever reason in PowerPoint, when I added a different picture, it covered up the number, so I'll say 98% of them are numbered. We'll figure it out. So when we're done here tonight, um, if you, while we're moving through this lesson, if you have a piece of paper and a pencil, if you see something you have a question about or whatever, just write the slide number down so I don't have to kind of try and go back and figure out what time of the video it was at and we can go back over it when I'm done, all right? Um, I'm still trying to figure out how to do a slideshow and keep you guys live or be able to answer questions because when I share my screen, for the most part, it looks like everybody disappears, all right? So I'm gonna share my screen right now in just a second. I did also, besides numbering all the slides, uh, a little statement uh, like I did last week just to make sure um, everybody's clear here because I have absolutely no idea of your level of experience, okay, all you guys. And I don't um, know what type of equipment you have at your disposal. The purpose of these sessions is to just expose you to the types of problems and situations that I find myself in on a daily basis, all right, uh, as a toolmaker and as a specialty machinist. 
Uh, what I'm trying to do here is expose you guys to real life manufacturing and how I personally handle each of the problems that comes my way. Um, there's many ways to handle each situation. This is the way I choose to handle mine. Um, these are tried and true solutions from uh, 45 years of manufacturing, but there's always other solutions and I'm always uh, uh, open to hear them. Um, but I've always tried to improve what, too on what I did last time. You know, uh, when I do a part and uh, they only needed one or two of them, I might hang on to it a little different instead of they give me a 50 of them, 100. I usually don't get production work, but I'm always looking to improve what I did last time. So uh, again, my job requires me to produce parts in one, uh, one offs and dies extremely quickly. And uh, these lessons are meant to give you some insight again on how I do things. So uh, I said this in the, the video for the promo for this class, that years ago when I was an avid golfer, I used to go out every year and take a lesson and every year or so. And uh, I would actually pay the pro for the first 20 minutes just to watch him hit golf balls. And I would learn just as much from watching him as when he started screwing around with my grip, which always felt like he was ruining my golf swing, right? But so what you're kind of doing the night is watching my golf swing, all right? And uh, the quirks and all. So with that being said, uh, let's get the slideshow started and see where we go from here. Any other, anybody got anything to say before I get going? Quiet. Yeah, oh, quick go question. Is there a text-based um, box that we can type questions into? I don't. You, I, you I don't want to be interrupted. I don't mind if it interrupts me at all. Um, the only thing is, is that um, um, there's a, usually a thing there to wave your uh, hand. It might be down in your controls. Your, the controls you see are a little different than what I see. Uh, when I hit the uh, share screen button, I don't know if those controls will be available, but it looks like you may be able to, and we'll experiment with that tonight, okay? But yes, please, it won't interrupt me. Hopefully, I won't be so focused on the presentation that I miss your, your questions, but if you do have one I missed, we'll go back through it at the end, all right? All right. You know, I was uh, talking to somebody this past week, and... Um, uh, a little story. I, uh, I love manufacturing history. You know, I'm in a, a manufacturing town here in Erie, Pennsylvania. This used to be one of the tool and die capitals of the world here. I was surrounded by Cleveland, Pittsburgh, and Buffalo. To Toledo's not far up the road. And of course, Detroit. And uh, you know, most of that's gone now. But uh, as I've gotten older, I've really come to appreciate um, the history of stuff. And if you've ever followed me and read any of the stuff I write and the books I put out and everything, that's, that's a very obvious to anybody that knows me. Well, I came across uh, this book a couple weeks ago, and of all things, it was in my mother-in-law's uh, office. I was helping her. My mother-in-law's 86, and I was helping set her, getting her set up on a Zoom call, of all things. And uh, I said, what are you doing with a, a Henry Ford book? Well, it turns out a, a friend of hers in college wrote this book in 1980. Well, I have to tell you, um, this book is just really a lot of fun, and uh, uh, I'm almost done with it, uh, but it's... I have learned so much about the Ford Motor Company. I don't care if you're a Ford guy or not. Henry Ford was a unique individual. And one of the things that came up in this book was this place called the River Rouge Plant. And I've been surprised at a lot of guys I know that are kind of into manufacturing like I am. I've never heard of this. Well, it's still there, but it was built in 1927. And this place was, uh, I mean, there's so many good stories in this book, but uh, that's kind of the River Rouge Plant in the, in the heyday back in the 20s and 30s. And you can just see by looking at the picture, we've got the, their own, Ford had their own uh, ships in to bring in their own iron ore to make their own steel. Uh, the place had its own power plant. Another uh, picture of the Rouge. And I've got some facts about this uh, in just a second, but I won't keep you long with this, but this is a fun one for you guys to research a little bit. Again, another picture of the plant and another picture, that's the Henry Ford II, it looks like a uh, freighter coming in with some iron ore. And there's the tool and die shop. <laughs> it's a, that's a nice small tool room, right? But I can see at the bottom of the picture, you got the guys down here with their white aprons running their uh, bridge ports and a lot of lathes, a lot of engine lathes, but it looks like good lighting, a nice big crane going overhead. So that's a tool room. So just a few things about the River Rouge plant, 93 build, buildings, 16 million square feet, 75,000 employees. Henry Ford was a stickler on cleanliness and he had that plant painted every month. And uh, he hired 5,000 men just to do that. They used 11,000 gallons of eggshell white and 5,000 gallons of machine blue paint every month. 16,000 gallons of paint a month. I can't even fathom that. Um, they produced their own steel. 
Uh, they had their own self-contained power plant, purchased their own iron ore mines, purchased their own coal mines in West Virginia, purchased railroad to transport the coal, made their own glass at the factory, owned their own freighters, and purchased two and a half million acres in Brazil for the rubber trees, which I guess they eventually sold back to uh, the Brazilian government after they figured out how to make synthetic rubber for the tires. So there's a lot of good stuff out there on YouTube. If you just uh, Google the River Rouge plant, there's videos, there's pictures, uh, and again, uh, Henry Ford was just like all of us, right? Uh, not perfect. And this book will show that, which is great. You'll learn the good and the bad of Henry Ford. But uh, as I always say, eat the meat, throw out the bones. But what this guy was doing uh, back then is, is, is a, a really impressive. You'll enjoy it. So again, that's the name of the book, Henry Ford, The Wayward Capitalist. A lot of fun. All right. As promised, I th said I'd start off with one of my favorite tools. That was actually a suggestion from uh, one of the participants last week. And, uh, um, you know, I've got a lot of tools. And uh, this is just one of my favorites. I hope you'll enjoy this one. This is my, my Greist Micro Height Gauge. Now, this little guy here uh, was tough to find. Um, when I was coming up in the trade back in the late 70s and early 80s, all the tool makers that I really thought were good had one of these. And the years went by, and I said, I really like to find one of these. Well, I couldn't figure out what it was called. I kept typing in small height gauge, mini height gauge, and finally I found the micro height gauge. So I bought this one on eBay, and uh, if we look at it, that's the, that's the name of it again, the Greist micro, micro height gauge, um, New Haven, Connecticut. I don't think they still make them. This one came in its own box with the velvet, the leather cape, pretty nice stuff. And uh, it also comes with a two-inch riser, all right? And uh, my box, I think it had a three inch that seems to be missing. But uh, I don't use it a lot. But boy, just setting that thing out on my surface plate like that and leaving that for, there for a day uh, stripes, uh, strikes up a lot of great conversations. People love this thing. And I do use it in the machine sometimes. Uh, actually, it's a nice way to measure the height of uh, things once in a while when I'm in a hurry because it's small. Okay, it only has a two inch travel on it. And then I have a little video here, here of how it works. Oh, that's it. Uh, you can see it's on a one, two, three block. And you can see up at the top here, the zero set right there. Um, it's, it's really a nice piece. So it, uh, let's, let's see if this is a video here. That just kind of shows how it works. You just turn the thumb screw up and down. You probably already figured that out, but amazingly accurate. Uh, we used to use to describe lines on electrodes back in the day so we could grind uh, our draft on the electrodes right to a scribe line. All right, so let's get started with some of the stuff I do on a daily basis, okay? This is a simple welding fixture. Now, the plant I work in, we do a lot of pipe assemblies uh, for uh, locomotives. And a lot of these things are figure eight shaped. Uh, so we bought this special table that I'll show you in a minute. Well, this one, this particular one is just a, a prototype. That tube in the middle was cut at a weird angle, like 54 degrees, I believe. And they came running over to me one day and said, can you figure out a way, if you look up at the top there, there's just a flange sitting there, to make that flange line up with the, this pipe. So I had this piece of steel, and you'll see later in one of my slides, I've got a kind of a pile, a skid of scrap uh, steel, leftover chunks around my bench, so I can find something in this particular case. All I did was find this piece, like the tube is actually a one and five sixteenths in diameter, so it's 1.312. So uh, I cut it about one inch, uh, 315. You don't need to pound this thing in here. And if, obviously you've got to get it down past the uh, major diameter. So I, a half of that was what, uh, inch and five sixteenths, whatever it is, eight, eight, 12 or whatever. I went a little deeper. So I made sure I covered the center. So I'm a little past center line. And then that shows the flange in place for them to weld, okay? Now you can see I've got a little wedge here. I probably could have just cut that off. You'll see in the next picture, that all I've got in here is a dowel pin, all right? And that's what centers it up left to right. And you just, and you can see as you turn the pipe, it'll line up with the flange automatically. And then uh, they would just tack weld it in that position. So this little wedge that was left over probably could have uh, disappeared because as you can see, the slot was deep enough to, to carry the, hold the flange on this end. But uh, if we ever use it again, maybe I'll just knock that off. It didn't hurt anything. Now, you, I do little quick things like this. This did not go to a customer, and as you'll hear me, hear me say a lot, in-house stuff. I mean, I always like my stuff to look nice, even for the next guy, 
but I'm not frantic about it as if this was going to a customer, right? Perhaps if this would have been uh, going out to a customer, I may have knocked that off ahead of time. But in this case, they needed it now. That's what they got. It worked just fine, all right? So um, this is an interesting one. Um, these big C-shaped parts. A lot of weldments on this guy. And, uh, you know, it's interesting. You know, for you guys that have done this for a while or haven't done it, you know, most of the stuff I work on, I, I'll never see where it goes or what where, where this gets used on a train or what this thing does. But uh, in this particular case, this end with the red arrow was cut off too short. And what happens there is another block gets welded onto that, but there's supposed to be a dimension from the left side to this edge of 13 inches, uh, 20,000. Well, I don't know what it was, but man, they sure gobbed some weld on this thing, all right? There's a lot, I, I guess, you know, when I used to do some die welding, I usually would use TIG welding. I think we got the stick out on this one. So uh, got to figure out a way to hold this thing and uh, cut the snow off. So here's my Kurt Vice. Now, as you can see, uh, well, you can't see the back side. Oh, yes, you can. I've got jaws set on the front and back side of my Kurt Vice jaw. I've got a stop here set over on the right side. I've also got a, um, a, a setup bowl here with two T-nuts on it. Just, uh, uh, I'm sorry, just two flange nuts just lightly snugged in so when I clamp the vice shut, I don't squeeze the part shut, all right? You don't wanna do that. You could, it usually springs back, but it's gonna affect how this end comes out. Now, there's a lot to look at here. Um, I do setups like this a lot. This particular curved vice is a pretty, uh, it opens pretty wide and I, I, today I actually figured out because I had to do it, um, I could get 17 inches in between my vice jaws, all right? So that's the setup from the top. A little messy, but I'll show you a few things here. A lot of times, all I do on the top of my vise is I just use three-quarter pins. This happens to be a three-quarter inch um, just piece of aluminum. I set those on top of the vise, and you'll just see if, uh, all these chips here. That's a little pot magnet I've got sitting there just to kind of keep them in the same place. Uh, it's not that I, they had to stay in the same place because there's those lugs that are sticking up out of the weldment, and it's kind of kind of fit between them, and you get tired of trying to line them up. So the magnet just kept it in the same place each time. You'll also notice. I've got this, this post over here. Well, a few years ago, since I used this type of setup a lot on top of my vice jaws, and I figured out all I have to do is put three quarter inch dowel pins on top or, or, or a three quarter inch piece of steel or aluminum right here. I just needed to calculate a height for the top of my vice plus my three quarter dowel pins. Now you'll see in the next slide, there it is right there. And you'll see another shot of this on another slide. But there you go. So there it is right there, and I'm gonna clamp right over that spot, all right? And it's a good side view. I guess my pin rolled away a little bit. We'll push it back before we get the next one in. And then on the next slide, you'll see I use a jack screw as a, as a uh, setup clamp. These are much faster, and not really faster for the first piece, but the problem with the jack um, blocks is, the, uh, the step blocks, it's easy to knock those things over if you're doing more than one part. You know, in my tool making days, I'd clamp something to a mill and it might be on there for two, three days, sometimes a week. I didn't have to worry about bumping the st step blocks. Well, I found out now, you know, when I'm changing parts, I, you, you can bump these things every time you have to reset them. So I just use jack screws like that. I hope that makes sense. I hope you can see uh, what's going on here. Uh, I've just got the jack screw set under here to, to hold the clamp in place or to, to, to elevate the clamp. And you can see it's set a little bit higher than the part. And then this post is the height of my vice jaw, the top of my vice jaw, plus three quarters of an inch. And I use these all the time. Um, I know the top of my, uh, the from my table to my uh, Kurt vice jaw base is two and seven eighths. I know that. I can't tell you what it is to the top of your vice jaw plus three quarters of an inch. I don't know if they're all the same, so I don't wanna give you that dimension. Now, while we're looking at this picture, note too, these big lugs sticking out of the top of the part, all right? That's gonna be another problem when I have to flip it over and get the weld off the other side, and we'll see that in a minute. So there's my example there. I've set a jack screw instead of these step clamps, all right, of step blocks, because I, it's just so easy to tip these things out of the way every time you change a part. And again, big difference from when I was a tool baker to now doing a, a 20 part run. I, you really get tired of picking these things up. So that's the way it looks after the first uh, 
operation, first thing I do is I take this one inch uh, carbide end mill, carbide inserted end mill, and I cut these things down. Now, um, I got them as close as I could without cutting in. They're warped a little bit because of the heat. But uh, uh, then I, you'll see at the end, I just take a, a, a light disc sander and blend them in, all right? But uh, that's how I removed that stock. No problem with vibration. We're clamped right here, uh, very close to the work, on a nice steady uh, bar underneath. No sweat there. I take light cuts, though. We are hanging out in the middle of nowhere. Uh, I think I had about 150 thousandths to remove. I just took it really fast, 20 thousandths deep cuts. Okay? I only got 20 of these things to do. I don't need to throw anything out. I don't need any vibration. And you get a nice part. And then I took um, a carbide end mill and walked it around uh, to machine the sides off. I think you'll see that there. And these sides didn't always come out totally perfect. Again, this is a big piece of steel, not huge, but it's big enough. There's some warpage there. I got them as close as I could without having to repick up each part. I finally got a happy medium. And what I would do is I'm really good with disking things in because I used to polish injection molds. So that's how I had to do it. If I would have sat there and build these things all in and match them, you know, they varied by as much as 10,000. So uh, all I was really worried about was this left edge. That's what I needed to hold. That was the dimension, okay? That's kind of what it looks like when I'm done. All right, it's been uh, uh, machined all the way around. Again, they're gonna weld something on the end of this, but that, that's what it looks like. That's me I'm having uh, taken the scotch bright pad and just lightly buffed it in. So we've got the weld off that side and we've got the weld off the uh, periphery of the part. So now I gotta check that 13 inch dimension, 13 inches 020. And uh, I've got this 12 inch digital height gauge. Well, that's not going to reach. So, what I've done here is you look at the bottom, I put it on a 246 block. All right. So, it's got a two inch riser on it, and uh, it's going to measure two inches off. So, I'm at 11 inches 021 and a half. 11 inches 21 thousandths and a half. 11 inches and 21 and a half thousandths. Let's get it right. So, it's two inches off. So, I'm within a thousand and a half of where they want. We're good. Uh, we have plus or minus five on that. And I'll tell you a little bit. Um, I will tell you also, this uh, digital height gauge, if you can ever get one of these, really worth its weight in gold. I use this thing all the time for checking parts, laying out things. It's just a wonderful uh, piece of equipment. Now, how, how are we holding that in place? Well, basically, a few years ago, I found this uh, gem on eBay. It's a brown and sharp squaring block. It's just a magnet. And, uh, you know, I think the new, I think they go for about $250. I found this one for $60. And it's great. And I use it for inspection like this all the time. So if we go back, you can see that's what's holding the part vertically. Because we're not cutting and we're just inspecting. So I don't need a lot of strength. I just need something to hold this thing down to the surface plate and to uh, hold it uh, perpendicular to the surface plate. That does a fine job. So there you can see it right there, how it's hooked up. Now we've got to cut the other side. And uh, I know that I got caught by surprise. Uh, I didn't realize those lugs stuck out so far on, 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 the, on the other side, so I couldn't put it in the vise. So a quick and dirty setup for this one, because I do not have to um, go around the outside of the part that's already done. I'm just going to get the weld off the face. You can see I've got this table. Now, we've, on my milling machine, I've got this table with these, um, all these holes in it. Every other hole is a bolt or a dowel, it's a screw hole. <coughs> Dowel, screw hole dowel. So those are all half 13 uh, screw holes and all um, half inch dowel pin holes. Now, if you've watched any of my videos or if you've been in the tool and die, I said, I think I have a video there or a lesson called my sub table. And I also have a smaller one that I can put in my vice, which I use a lot. You might even see it on this lesson. But for this, in this case, I've just got a couple dowel pins stuck in the back here to line it up straight, fairly straight. I'm not that worried. I'm just machining the surface here, okay? Um, but I don't want to run into this clamp. And I've got a dowel pin here on the right. And then you can see the red arrow. That's the area I have to cut. And I will say that's a little closer to the clamp than I'd like to come, but it all worked out. Didn't run into it. And that's a little bit of a, a isometric view of it. You can get another view. All I've got this thing is on is a one, two, three, three of them. Uh, one over here, one here, one here. And I'm clamped in the back, clamped here. Almost could have got away with just a clamp here. But just for stability and vibration, I put an extra one back here and everything was fine. Again, I'm clamped almost right over where I'm milling. Same procedure as the last one. There was about 150 thousandths of uh, weld to take off of this. 
So I just took it down and light cuts with the same one inch end mill, uh, carbide end mill at about 20 thousandths of um, each cut. And we're not in a case like this. I'm just trying to save these parts. I'm not trying to set the world on fire with how fast can I get them done and ruin one. All right, let's see here. That's another look at the setup. Um, three, one, two, three blocks. A couple of uh, dowel pins in the table here. Actually, you can see them. I'll, I, have a, I cheat sometimes. Those are long spotting drills, <laughs> but they're, they work just fine. So they're a little bit undersized. They slip in the holes easier. And that's the view from the top. All right. Um, and that's what it looks like. Believe it or not, I hope I'm done with these things, but I save these pictures too at work. So if I ever get this back again, I'll kind of remember how I did it. I do a lot of different jobs and uh, it's important for me to catalog what I did. All right, let's see here. Uh, quantity of seven of these. Oh, all right. Very typical part for, to, to come my way. They've uh, taken up these, uh, this material and what they'll do is we have a plasma machine and they'll burn these things out oversize, all right? And then they get them to the lathe department. The lathe department will face them off to the right dimension bore the hole in the middle and put the um, O-ring groove in. Then they hand them to me and say, can you do that to it? All right, very typical of what I, uh, project I would have to work on. So basically to hold on to that part, uh, what I do in this situation is I go over to the uh, skid over by the machine. And uh, like you can see, there's a lot of dead weight there. I'll find something there I can use. In this case, I found that. It's about a one inch by two inch by three inch, just block of cold roll. And all I did here was uh, uh, machined a little boss down about three thousandths under the diameter of the part. So I don't have to pound it on. And then I just tapped the middle for a, a half 13. So now all I have to do is put a stud in there and a nut and you'll see a sea washer. Now I love these sea washers. And I believe, again, if you're at the Tulum Dye Guy, write that down. I believe that there's a, a, a lesson there on the sea washers. Um, I love sea washers, they're great, uh, they're heavy duty. And once I loosen that nut, all I have to do is slide the nut, the um, um, part of the, the sea washer out of the way and just lift the part off every time. Nice quick setup, um, it works great. The trick with this stuff is I always make sure I'm machining, uh, uh, climb milling. So I, it's just an old superstition that I'm kind of tightening the bolt. I'm afraid if I went the other way, I could loosen the nut, I, I, you know what I'm saying? So. I climb mill and I don't, again, for seven parts, I'm not here today to set the record and speed. I just want seven parts done. I had them down to about four minutes a piece. And uh, if I had a hundred of them to do, we might look at something different, or, uh, but I don't, I'm only holding this with one bolt and I, and, and nut. And I'm very careful again, when I'm only running seven parts, I don't need to spin a part. And that's a big thing I, I, you have to learn in this trade back to real life experiences. You don't need to kill yourself if you're only making five or six or something, all right? Just get it done right and they'll be happy. It's when you get 100 and 200, uh, that's when they get a little antsy when things take a little bit longer, okay? So that's what it looks like when it's done. The uh, uh, fixture's in place. I've gone around and I've uh, drilled the holes. And uh, I think we'll talk about those holes in a minute. Um, I use uh, these little drills called allied drills occasionally, and they're spade drills. But I've got to be careful because my machine doesn't have through the spindle coolant, but I'll go through, I can, I'm comfortable with going up to about three quarters of an inch deep with them. After that, I gotta be really careful because they'll burn up on me, but this part's not that thick and I was able to use an ally drill. And the nice thing about these allied spade drills is that's a seven sixteenths diameter hole and they come out seven sixteenths plus or minus a thousandths every time. And for those of you who know, uh, it's amazing how a high speed drill can drill undersized usually, but oversized is a problem. I don't ever have to worry about that with those allied drills. I use them whenever I can. All right, two welding fixtures. Let's see here. Another typical thing they'll do at work is uh, burn these out from the plasma machine. And at first I thought they were totally symmetric. They sure do look at, uh, but they're eventually gonna go on uh, a table like this. Uh, I believe uh, this is a stock photo from the internet. It's called a Bluco table, E-L-U-C-C-O. That table is about a $30,000 table. And what they do is they put that in our CAD system at work, 3D design, 
and all these figure eight pretzel pipe assemblies we do they can modularly hey guys could you uh if you're not muted yet i'm sorry please everybody mute themselves a little background noise thank you um it's a modular setup and these guys could lay all this out in cad 3d and then we will make parts that will fit on these uprights and things like that so these these uh, parts i just made are going to fit modularly on something on this table i don't ever get to see the end unless i have to walk by it but i'm familiar with it because i do them all the time so that's what they gave me to do now a couple things you'll see i added a couple holes here uh, this, these two half inch holes here um I gotta see if I can move everybody here, guys. <laughs> All right. So, anyways, back to this uh, this this part. They uh, had given me the print already, and then they uh, had added these two extra holes here, and I just put them in there for illustration purposes. So, when you see the final part, you'll wonder where these two holes came from. So, this is very typical uh, of this of type of fixture I'll build for these welding tables. And um, the outside doesn't mean anything. The flame cut edge could just stay there because what we're looking for is something's gonna get positioned on these pins and these two big diameters with chamfers on them um, are what lock it into the system modularly. They have these big pins that fit in with ball bearings on them. So I've done enough of these now. I actually, um, uh, I used to circle mill this hole out to this the, the, uh, diameter. I actually had a gauge pin made by our lathe department. And uh, I finally talked them into buying me a reamer so here's a good tip for you guys. If you ever need good reamers, you might already know this. Um, Lexington reamers are the best. I've learned that since I've been in the machining trade, uh, the machinist trade. Uh, they make custom reamers and they'll last forever and they, they cut exactly on size. So um, I, I was a typical thing. So they'd spent some money and got me a reamer to do these holes. They do them so often. Uh, the way I usually attack these holes, I think I'll show them on the next slide. I usually drill them out to an inch and 16th. I circle mill them out to about uh, one inch 093, one inch and 93,000 diameter, and then I run the reamer through. Actually, I, before I run the reamer through, I put the chamfer on, then I run the reamer through. So the chamfer doesn't kick up a burr on the, on the final uh, diameter. Now, I'm familiar enough with these. I saw they wanted the chamfer on both sides, and I questioned that, and they did not. So when you see the final parts, you'll notice there is not a chamfer on both sides because they really didn't need it. So when I told you before that they all looked identical, they, these two parts look identical, there is, for whatever reason, a flat here. So I wanted to make sure I, I, I uh, cut the parts, machine the parts with that flat. And you can see it's down here. It's not there. It's not there. I don't know why. I think that was, I don't know. <laughs> but it was there. So I, I positioned the parts the same way so they look like the drawing. Another thing, this is a big one for you guys. If you ever get flame cut parts and then you don't need to mill uh, the periphery or the outside on, remember uh, these flame cut parts, the thicker the part, they call this kerf, K-E-R-F. Back in the, the mold making days, I used to call that draft. All right. You want to make sure the widest part, I know this might sound obvious, but make sure you put the wider part down in your vise. Uh, look, your vise jaw will grab that fine. You won't have any problems. If you put the uh, narrow part in your vice jaws, i.e. the top of this, as you squeeze the jaws, it could start pushing it right out. So always grab by the widest part. And they, that's, you can see it's pretty severe. Uh, for a one inch thick uh, bar like that, it's not uncommon to have 30 or 40 thousandths degrees of, uh, or 30, 40 thousandths of uh, what we would call curve. Uh, you'll also find, just for a reference, if this block is supposed to be two inches wide at the top, or two inches wide, it'll be about two inches wide at the top, and then the, the flame pushes away, and you'll end up being around two inches, oh, um, two and a sixteenth at the bottom, right? But the, you always want to clamp at the widest part. So let's look at this quick setup. <clears throat> uh, basically, uh, because I don't have to do a lot of heavy milling here, I, I, I will run things like this, just holding it in the vise, all right? Um, drilling and some light milling, this will be just fine. Uh, and I know that because... Uh, um, I do this all the time and I've never thrown a piece out. If I had to go around this thing and mill or do some heavy milling, I'd probably have to put a clamp here. But for what I'm doing, this will be just fine. You can see I've got this stop over here with a very long rod in it. Uh, a lot of these stops come with a threaded hole. I drill that right out and I, and I ream it. And it's a lot faster. I put a, the set screw in and I can set these stops so fast. Now, you're all go also going to see... I am sitting on inch and a half parallels inside this vise, all right? 
All right. So basically what I've got down here is this bar of steel. And this bar of steel is two and seven eighths. It matches the bed on my vice jaw. All right. I've got several pieces of steel that size, two and seven eighths. And then all I did was add this inch and a half uh, parallel on, on top of this. And now I'm equal all the way across. So I've got an inch and a half parallel in here. I've set up a bar that's the same height as my vice. and put an inch and a half parallel here. I'm nice and flat all the way across. And that's the side view of that. Um, this is a really handy thing for you guys with curved vices. I've got this piece and I've got three other like two inch diameter posts that are um, two and seven eighths. And when I hang things out on my vice or things like that, those come in so handy. You can, uh, you, and, and it doesn't matter. Uh, you, all you need is matching parallels then to go under. If you're going to put parallels on your piece, as long as you know this is the same height as your curt vice, just find matching uh, parallels and put it under there, and now you're flat all the way across. So I use that stuff, the setup like this every day. And, of course, that's my, one of my favorite stops. It's a, a swing stop. Uh, again, uh, and this particular rod, I've got a little uh, – radius ground, ground on to it because again this is a, has definitely got that uh, kerf angle to it so i find that a ball end will hit the same spot every time versus a flat end so that's the finished product um the inch and uh, uh the 1.108 and three tenths diameter holes i drill them out to an inch and a sixteenth i circle mill them to uh one inch and uh, basically three thirty seconds and then I just read them to the uh, one inch, one oh eight, three tenths. So that's a quick, easy project, but that's something, uh, you know, I think they gave that to me about quarter after three last Friday afternoon. And when I left at 430, those were, those were complete. That's the last thing I took a picture of before I left. Seven production parts. Oh, all right. We do a lot of flanges at work. All right. Now. How am I going to hold on to this flange? I mean, you'll see what it's going to look like. I got to uh, cut all these holes in it. I'm going to drill. Actually, this is 316 stainless. So, um, what I do with these holes, again, for seven parts, I use a cobalt drill and I drill them out a 64th under and then I just um, circle mill them to the right diameter. The funny thing about this particular part is these chamfers actually matter. And uh, I don't know why they do that occasionally, uh, but those are, I believe, uh, 16 millimeter diameter holes and they want a uh, 18 millimeter chamfer on them. So, uh, so they're the, basically a, a, a one millimeter chamfer, one degree, one millimeter by 45 degrees. So here's how I hold on to these. I told you before, uh, there's a, one of my videos, I, lessons, I've got the subplate that fits into my jaws. And I have to use the outside of my jaws. The, I have to use these uh, vice jaws that I clamp on the outside of my curt vice on both the fixed jaw and the movable jaw. But this is an 11 by 18 subplate. And again, same deal. Ha every half inch, I've got uh, dowel bolt, dowel, dowel screw, dowel screw. So <clears throat> in this particular case, all I do is uh, mount a couple of uh, production parts that we scrapped that happen to have a, a counter bore and a... Um, hole in the middle of the half 13. So I just use these as, as, as uh, stops to locate the part accurately each time. So let's check that out for a second. So this is my um, zero it. Somebody gave me a, at work about a year or two ago and it's kind of cool. I like it. Uh, it's, a, it, it's nice. And I actually removed the rods that came with it and put raw, longer rods in so I could uh, um, uh, measure or, or tram in bigger rings like this. But the question was, I was just curious. You're going to see how I'm going to clamp this. I think, let's see, should that start? Well, be surprised if you were to watch that in slow motion that part isn't perfectly round and you know when these come out of a production machine um when they come out of a production machine they're uh sometimes the hydraulic chucks squeeze them a little bit it's not bad 
but you're never going to get a zero reading all the way around. It's going to fluctuate by about a thou and a half in, in spots, and that's as close as you can get it, and that's fine for what we're doing here. But then what I wanted to show you here was the world's largest sea washer, okay? And because we have a, uh, a plasma at work, I, I have them burn these things out for me all the time, and as you can see, what a great way to hold this part. Perfect. It's going to hold it straight down, and I, I've got maybe one even bigger than this for a big, another big ring I do. But then I started thinking, because I was thinking of you guys, how do I know that part didn't move when I clamped it down? Well, I could test it with a shim in between my stops, but then I started thinking that I have this, um, I have this Indicol. You can look this up online, the Indicol. Uh, I bought this particular one in uh, 1980, but the rod here was a little short. Well, you know what? It's a quarter inch rod, so I just put a longer rod in. Now I can indicate the part in after it's been clamped, just to double check it, it was fine, by the way, but it was kind of interesting to see uh, um, how easy that was to alter that indicol that easily. So the only problem is now it doesn't fit in the box anymore. <laughs> but uh, let's see here. Before I go to that, that we, uh... okay, that's it. So what you're going to see now, this next video, is the holes are done, and now I'm going to chamfer them. I've chamfered the top of the holes, but now I've written a program to chamfer the bottom of the holes so I don't have to do it by hand after the part comes out. Um, so there's the end of the call, and I think in another slide I've got a picture of this end mill, but as you can see it right there, there's a little Seco cutter, S-E-C-O. You can find this a single insert uh, uh, chamfer cutter. They're very handy, and as you can see for uh, back chamfering. There's a little secret I learned in this trade, too. Is it's, uh, is when I switch from <laughs> to machining, um, if the chamfers matter, they look a lot better and they're a lot more accurate. If you can do what I just did, back chamfer them with a tool like this. So uh, it's a nice, as long as your hole is a little bit bigger than the, the, the chamfer tool, right? So, uh, but there's my Indicol, uh, which is nice. Now, what's nice about the Indicol too, is you can see it's clamped up here to the spindle. I don't have to change and put a drill uh, chuck in there or something else for my indicator. I could just clamp my Indicol right over the tool I've got in the spindle. Very handy, all right? Now, again, I think we already saw that slide. That's the Indicol in there. And that's uh, my original box. And I just want to make sure you saw there's the original rod. Looks like it's a couple inches long, and I think this one's about three and a half inches long. And it gave me a lot more um, distance for tramming these uh, uh, large diameter uh, flanges in. Now you can see I still got the original box, and uh, which is interesting because when I was a kid, I had all these toys. I wish I would have saved the original boxes for those too. But <laughs> but for some reason, I still have the box. But now. Uh, with that rod in there, that won't fit in the box anymore. We'll, we'll live. It's been really handy, though. I've been using it a little bit more now. All right, what's next here? I'm actually surprising. Oh, that's the picture of the cutter. The end mill, that, the little chamfer cutter, which you already saw. But that's a better view of it. This is a little single uh, uh, inserted carbide tool, from, again, from Seco, S-E-C-O. And uh, very handy for stuff like that. Now... This is interesting. How many of you guys have ever used a chamfer gauge? I really never used a chamfer gauge. Well, I used to just trig it out and use a ball dimension to check my chamfers. Well, then I, and I kind of looked at this thing the first time. I said, this looks a little hokey, right? But it's got a stare at name on it. Well, this is pretty slick, actually. So uh, that's what the bottom looks like. They make a smaller one than this. I don't know if they make a bigger one than this uh, for checking different size holes. But this one will go from, uh, gosh, like a... Uh, 300 thousandths diameter to uh, maybe uh, three quarters or almost an inch. It's, it's really handy. Now, interesting. You can see it's got our calibration uh, um, sticker on it, but you can see that the Texas is set to. These are all, these are all different where it says set to. A friend of mine's got one at work. It says uh, 16 thousandths. This one says 10 thousandths. What they mean by that is you set it on your surface plate and uh, 
you make sure it's reading when you push it down all the way on this particular case, 10 thousandths, and then it'll read accurately. You can see you've got a hand wheel here that's going to read off the hundredths, and then and uh, it's, it's extremely accurate. So it's uh, this will check. Uh, it says zero to ninety, and it's exactly right. It'll check 82 degree chamfers also. So uh, if you can get a hold of one of these, let me show you how this works here. Now, um, this is a this job here. I might have to explain this what I've done here. I had to put these chamfers on by hand. When I was all done, they have to measure 550,000. before that run. So what I want to make sure you understand there is, uh, again, you can see I've got a hand drill there. And uh, I already chamfered this plate from the front, and now they want this in the back. Now the chamfers, even though they're curled out, uh, whatever that millimeter size is, is I've got about 10,000. So you can see this one in the right, right corner was a little deep. They're not going to fail that part for that. But uh, uh, that's how close you get with um, just using a, a hand drill and a good countersink, all right? So that's a really handy tool for you guys to look at. If you ever have to do chamfers that really matter, uh, uh, I, the, the guy at work that showed me his, the kid at work, he got his at his, his, a junk store for five bucks. <laughs> but you can get yours, I think they're on eBay for about a hundred. Very nice tool. All right, so then the last thing, I think, which slide number are we on here? No, I've got other, other things. Here's a question. Does it matter if your edge finder isn't running true? Now, I asked that question to several people at work that I trust. I asked my boss, and everybody had to think about that. Well, no, it doesn't matter. Well, yes, it does matter. Well, I had a few minutes the other day, so I just I had to prove this to myself. I, I, in my head, I didn't think it would matter, but I didn't want to put this out there unless I tested it. And this is a nice edge-finding test for you guys, too. So that's my first edge finder. That's an old one. I bought one as an apprentice, chucked up, and you can see it's running out about seven thousandths. All right, it's just chuck, chucked up in an old drill chuck. And then I picked up the edge of a one, two, three block, and I set a zero. I set it on X, Y, and Z, but we're really concerned with X. X is set at zero. Next, I've got an indicator edge finder set up to call it. And that one's running within about a half a thousandths. All right. And then, again, picked up the edge. Look at the X, zero. So it really didn't matter. Well, then I said, well, let's go through all the things I have to pick up edges, right? So then I got out the my uh, Heimer 3D indicator, which I love this thing. It'll be on my list to show you. And that one runs out. That's when running within a couple tenths also, maybe a tenth. This is my one of my favorite tools. And that checked in at... Uh, 98 it's going to be a hundred thousandths off because it doesn't have a, uh if you've ever used a Heimer, you don't have to move in a hundred thousandths for half your edge finder it, it it's uh it's calibrated to read zero when it's on the edge unlike an edge finder which is usually a hundred thousandths off so in a perfect world this would have read minus 100 it's reading 98 thousandths and eight tenths i would trust that more than the edge finder believe it or not because i i trust the the Heimer that much now we're still within a thousand thousand two tenths Finally, the gold standard, if I really had to pick up an edge that really, really mattered, I would use this. And let's see if I get another view of this. This is a little magnetic uh, edge finder that I'm going to place on the side of that block. I'm going to sweep that groove with a dial indicator. And you can see there, zero. zero that's as centered as that spindle is ever going to get over that edge as far as i'm concerned all right we go up 99 thousandths and two tenths so 
the bottom line was the uh, first two edge finders read zero and zero, and the uh, uh, Heimer and the oh, indicator wow. were within four tenths of each other. So and that's why I said I probably those are my gold standards, but you're still not too far off with the edge finders. But you did notice also that the um, uh, the edge finder running out doesn't appear to affect it at all. So chuck that thing up in your old drill chuck and let it rip, I guess. But that was an interesting experiment. There gives you four different lessons there, two in different ways to pick up an edge. So again, my two most accurate edge finders within four tenths, all of them together within a total of one, one thousands and two tenths. Uh, if it needs to be dead on, I still trust the indicator method above all else. But the Heimer's were really close. All right. This is an interesting one. Milling a plate flat and parallel. This is a fixture plate I designed and built the other day. Um, I've got this part that we have to cut an O-ring all the way around that weird shape. And we tried to hold that in vice jaws, and it's just not flat enough. And uh, so uh, the plates aren't flat enough is actually what the problem is. I can't, no matter what I do, I can't get it flat enough. The, the, the groove that goes all the way around this part, it's got to be plus or minus I've got plus or minus four, which that sounds like a lot, but boy, I'll, I'll tell you, if you're all of a sudden this end plate is bowed three or four thousandths, and this end, you, you hit that eight thousandths really fast. So I decided to make this fixture. Well, anyways, um, I, I can pretty much mill our plates at the plant faster and, and better than we can blanch or grind them. And I've learned a lot of secrets about, about doing this. So here's, here's a couple of them. Whenever you're going to mill a plate like this uh, flat, what I do is I, when I set the first side in my jaws, I don't hammer it down with a dead blow hammer. That plate's warped, skewed, whatever. I want to machine it in its dead, dead state. I don't want to force it, twist it flat, anything. So I skim it flat uh, on one side without pounding it down on parallels it's the parallels are there to keep it fairly flat but if it's got any warpage i want to take that out without um forcing it out of, uh if i force that thing down mill it flat and then as soon as i release the vice it's going to be un, it's not going to be flat again now the big argument is it drives my boss crazy they really get ticked off when they see this plate which is i believe this particular plate's about uh 10 by 15 and they really get aggravated when they see a mill a plate flat with a one inch carbide end mill versus a three inch or a two inch. Well, there's a, a couple reasons I do that. I firmly believe this plate comes out flatter with a smaller end mill, all right? And uh, because I don't have that big two or three inch diameter face mill coming in on the right, that's usually not the problem. I notice when they exit, they drop a little bit because half the cutter's off the part and the, and the, and the spindle relaxes just a hair. And I've noticed when I've done plates with larger uh, end mills, when I grind them myself, it takes an extra thou and a half or so to get those tool marks out. Well, so this plate, this whole plate, if I go around it with my cromers, is within about a thousandths and two tenths. I'll live with that, okay? That's well within the tolerance for the groove I've got to cut. And while we're here, um, this, this engraving I did all the way around here was just a visual aid. The, if it's me or the next guy, he, he'll know to put the three lugs that do go to the left, and it's just a nice uh, visual aid. I like visual aids, so um, th that, that didn't take that long to do, and it's a nice visual aid. But now, I did an experiment, though, with the graphics. Uh, that, that I actually took the time to engrave where they could pick up the WPC on that hole. All right, so that's the first pass across that part with a one-inch end mill. And if we look down at the bottom right, seven minutes. Okay, all right. Now let's have some fun with my boss. Let's go with the two-inch cutter. That should go a lot faster. Actually, that takes seven minutes and eleven seconds. Well, surely a three-inch uh, face mill only takes one, two, three, four, five, six passes. Seven minutes and thirty-one seconds. So the one-inch uh, end mill does this slightly faster, in my opinion. It def definitely does it a little faster, but it's much flatter. So take it from me. <laughs> I do this all the time. I, they, they still kind of wince when they walk by, but it's flat. All right. Again, the plate will come out much flatter and parallel due to the smaller cutter and due to its total pressure. 
All three tools will run at the same cutting speed. In this case, the surface fittings per minute is 600. The feed rate is uh, 20 thousandths inches per revolution, all right? The time difference is mainly due to the entry and exit time of each tool because each tool has a start at least one half of the diameter off the part and exit the part the same way. So that's where you uh, come into a lot of extra time, which doesn't appear to be that much extra time, but 30 seconds adds up. So the larger tools, see this again, they deflect. As it'll enter the workpiece, the smaller tools do not. In this case, this plate, well, sorry, it was 15 by 20, and it's parallel within two thousandths, I said a thousand two tenths. Okay, being flat and parallel, of being flat, parallel and flat. So imminently fine. It's, it, I guarantee you that's as flat as our blancher grinder would have got it. Carbide face mills will never cut surfaces as flat as the high speed ones. Back in the day, we used to have these big high speed steel shell mills, but they're, they are slow. Okay, so, the, but they would cut our mold pockets very flat. But the larger carbide face mills do produce that exit issue, which can be seen when you're surface grinding, as I already mentioned. Now, that is slide 109. I'm going to exit this uh, screen share, okay? And uh, I think that's it. Let me just look. That is it. So let me unmute everybody. You know what? If you guys have questions, just unmute yourselves. I think you can do that. You're allowed to do that. So anything to add to that? I know I kind of, that was in a full hour. Let me take a drink of water here. All right. Go ahead, to Thomas. Yeah, so I got a question on uh, what you just said at the very end that um, it gets it is flatter if you mill with HSS rather than uh, rather than carbide. Why is that? I should have said carbide inserted tools. A nice carbide end mill will be fine. A four flute, three flute, four flute will be fine. As soon as you put an insert into it, though, um, they they glaze and push a little bit. Even now, if they're brand new. They're pretty good, and, and you got to watch it. I mean, I'll, I've done it. You know, the plate's two thousands thick, and I skim two thousands off with it. But that's going to glaze those inserts. So, I mean, I think the carbide's a lot better than we used to get too. Now the carbide's got coatings on it. You know, back in the day, it'd be the carbide we got. I remember those triangular inserts we used to get off a tool truck with absolutely no chip breaker on it. I mean, they're just flat triangles, right? So, thank you for pointing that out. Yeah, uh, any good end mill, and the carbide will actually. As long as uh, what I meant to say there was when you add the insert into it, they won't come out quite as flat. Now, um, that plate you just saw there, though, I did that with a one inch carbided insert and mill just to save a little time because you are going a lot faster. You can't run a three quarter or one inch carbide end mill that fast. So, my mistake, good point. Anybody else? B Bill, if you're talking, uh, I, I, I see your mouth moving, but you got to unmute yourself. Oh, there he is. I can't hear it. Okay, good. Frank. I I can't Bill, hear. Bill, uh, I'm okay. I was <laughs> I was trying to get his uh, attention. Okay. All right. So you you're okay? Yeah, I'm fine. Thank you. You you, need, you don't need my attention, Frank. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, anything else? <laughs> I'm going to ask the stupid question in the group. I apologize, uh, but my respect to you all because you clearly do this for a living. I don't. Um, did you climb cut or did you uh, conventional cut when you're doing the uh, the flat surfacer? Excellent question. Back in the day, again, uh, when I learned how to cut, uh, it's an interesting thing. Uh, when I went through my apprenticeship, uh, one of the areas I got to go through was the cutter grinding department which is really valuable back then. I mean, you just didn't have uh, just these end mills everywhere that you could run forever. The carbide, everything's so much better now. We use a lot of high speed too. And high speed just, you know, that's why you had a cutting, cutter grinding department. I will tell you for fun, running a cutter grinding uh, department, working in there, it was a lot of fun. Boy, I learned a lot. But we would have these big shell mills. And back then, when we would mill our mold pockets, we did want to overlap conventionally. All right, we would take conventional cuts. He seemed to get a little bit better finish. Uh, now, in that particular video, uh, and I'll, I'll, now that you're bringing it up, next time I do that to a plate, I will uh, film it. But basically, I started at the top, and I go, I, I have choices in my programming. It's a Mazak, and I can go X bi directional, so I'll go over, then down, and over, and down, or X unidirectional, over, up. So it's always feeding the same way. 
So I'm going to say even on that play, I was conventional milling overlapping, okay? But I, I, I find I get a little bit better overlap. I just keep going one direction on that particular machine. I know I am retracting, but at four inches a minute, it really doesn't bother anything. So I just like to overlap. I, I just usually do it that way. But it's a good question. Anybody I appreciate else? that. Thank you very much. No problem. I'm going to say I've got, I've got two things. One, uh, when you were talking about using the smaller – smaller tool when you're uh when you're milling a plate flat right uh i've 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 run into depending on the machine i'm using or you know how many times it's been crashed <laughs> that the the bigger the tool depending on the like the tram of the head <clears throat> it will you know it'll hit lower on one end than the other. So if you're using the bigger tool, you know, you're going to have more, uh, more variations in it than if you're using the smaller, smaller tool to get it flat. Absolutely. Uh, and the second one was on one of your earlier slides, you were talking about, you had the, uh, I guess, turn down, piece of material you you were using as a jack stand that right. when you put your three quarter inch dowel pins on when you put your plate on was that screwed into your base plate or was that just sitting there anything that looked like a jack with a thread in it those are just sitting there we've got three oh, okay yeah <clears throat> now the posts they make yes those though the posts that aren't jacks those are just sitting there oh those okay plain yeah they're they're Two and seven eighths plus whatever it is the top of my jaw, the top of you know the movable jaw, plus three quarter. I just use three quarters because those big jaws I have on the end. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that system just works out for me. It, I don't think I ever planned that, but I can get things in and out of that machine so fast between my riser blocks I've got pre-made and the big pair, the the big uh, end blocks I use on the end of the vice jaws. I mean, like I said, I had to just throw a plate in the day of a seventeen inches. I. I shoehorned it in, but I could get 17 inches of that vice. So <laughs> anyone else? Yeah. yeah I'm curious. Uh... Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Steven, yeah, go I ahead. was just curious uh, for the G code or the, the code, uh, who, who writes that? Do you do that yourself for each individual part or would you get a file that came with the job? And no. Nope. Uh, Interestingly enough, but I'll let you guys in on a little secret here. The reason I have my job today is uh, I got good at running Mazax as a toolmaker. Uh, I was a toolmaker uh, from 80. I started my apprenticeship in 79, finished in 83. About 1986, my boss was buying Mazax, and he said, I'm going to put you on a Mazax. I, I wanted to just quit, right? I mean, I, I used to run manual machines and everything took me about a three weeks because my first week I had a horrible instructor. The other guy I was supposed to learn from was on vacation. Well, I fell in love with these Mazax because after years of eating chips in my face and down my shirt and smelling my hair on fire, I mean, those were fun days when I was 21. Uh, so when I started my own shop, I bought Mazax too. So the model, Mazax used to have a model that I think it was something like nobody gets the first part done faster than Mazax. Because I don't need to – no, I, to this day, no kidding, I know zero G-code, all right? But I write all my old programs. Every part you see there, I write myself. The only thing, uh, that big blue plate, I, I put the dike around there so you guys could see it better. That engraving mark around there, I could have programmed that. We do have a cam system at work, so occasionally I'll have that guy do that. I mean, was, I'd be, I, I, even with a Mazak, I'd be, that'd be a lot of screwing around, so – Occasionally, with, I will use the, that, but um, I do not personally work off files. Now, when I had my shop, we, of course, we worked off the files. We had the, the 3D uh, models coming in from our, our, our customers, and we have to design and cut our molds from those, right? But for 2D work, I, I, I just I love Basex. That's just partial. And, you know, I know they're, I know they're not a Mori Seeky or a LeBlanc Makino, but they're still well-built. I mean, you know... You, for what we do, it's just they're just fine. So I, I, I I've, uh, like I said, I write all, all my own stuff, except for very rarely I'll ask one of my uh, programmers for a, a, an assist, just to save some time. Next, I just have a quick question. Uh, when you're using your subplates, 
Uh, did you per did you line them up with dowel pins? Did, are they perpendicular with the spindle? Uh, did you do that in the beginning, or do they float? The sub uh, the sub plates that I put on top of my vise. Those first ones, and then that other one you use uh, for the auxiliary one. How do you know that's like you clamp that down? How do you know it's perpendicular with the spindle? Or good question. Um, here's here's a little trick here. So I used to have a small sub plate, but it was kind of small. Somehow I found this bigger one, but they both had that inch and a half pattern in it. So if you look at my sub plate, you'll see some socket heads in it that's holding a smaller one underneath. All right. So my sub plate actually looks like a T. All right. Uh, it, it's, it's a little wider on the top. So the part that goes in the jaws is a little lower. Well, so what I do is I, uh, I, I'll put parallels on my table because that hangs out past my jaws far enough where I'll stack parallels up. And I set that on parallels. And then I, I have a lead hammer, not a, bra, not a, a brass one and not even a rubber one. I, I like my rubber mallet, but when I really want things flat, really flat, I'll use a dead blow lead hammer. And I'll pound that thing down until I like it. I can't move my parallels. Then I'll take a skim over it. All right. Then uh, what I'll do, what I've now done, if that machine's got any travel problems, they've been taken out uh that 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 part now i don't care i don't mic it to see if it's flat i know it's flat with the machine all right so then what i do is i stamp a zero on the front of that so every time i put it in it's in the same spot every time i you know now if i were to mic it it may be a little different now if i get a job that's got to be really i'm going to use that sub plate i'll still run an indicator over it uh just to double check it and it's usually within a thou from left to right and then maybe a thou front to back. And that's usually good enough. But if I have to, to tweak it with some jacks or something, I will. But usually that system worked good for me. A nice mill over the top. Stamp it and make sure you use a mill with nice sharp inserts. It'll be nice and flat to the machine travel. And stamp the front zero and just put it in the same place every time. And you should be good to go. Now, what about lining the dowel pins when you use a fixture for that? I mean, you're... Do they, are they square with the spindle? Are they uh, perpendicular? Do you move it around? That is, does it float? No. Okay. No. So it's, it's always there and it's, it's just always on the machine. It's not moving. Oh no. I, I pick that right off and put it on a, on a bench when I need it. I just bring it back in and set it right on top of my vice jaws. Okay. So it's always square to the vice jaws. Yes. It is. Yeah. As long as I put the zero in the front every time. Okay. And then another quick question. Do you use like a, piece of copper you know you were talking about the kerf of the uh of the when you clamp something up do you ever use like copper or lead in there you know for more of a vice grip nope just the device itself nope the only problem i've ever had is when i first had to learn about uh, dealing with pl uh, plasma burnt plates i couldn't believe that how much how much kerf was on them when i first started there right. yeah and coming from the mold industry all my stuff was square I couldn't believe that your know, parts would come out of something that crooked. And, you know, and due to the tolerances, depending where these things are going, sometimes we ship stuff like that. All the customer wants is us to blow torch them out, drill and tap a hole in the middle and ship them. Well, after you load a couple in with the, the small end down and you squeeze them out of your vise a few times, you realize as long as the wide part is at the bottom of your jaw, you're good to go. That's been my experience anyways. Okay, I, uh, I don't, the other question was like uh, when you were milling with that small cutter, I went through kind of like a training with a blancher grinder. We were, had residual on the, uh, on the magnet. So we would just clamp it lightly, block it up, and take the high spots and then flip the part. Did you ever do that? Here's the problem. Um, I don't run the blancher grinder, all right? Okay. So, <laughs> I mean, it's, they're hardly around anymore, but... The, what sec I did. the second word you mentioned was training. All right. Wow. So it was interesting. A couple years ago, the guy who runs that department was going to be gone for a vacation. And they asked me if I could kind of keep an eye on it. And I had to learn how to run the Blanchard grinder. All right. That's kind of a scary machine the first time. When that wheel comes flying out over your pieces. It takes the metal off. Though. Oh, I'll tell you what. But. So uh, they gave me a Blanchard ground plate one day and there, no, there was nobody around and I put this in my machine and this, this thing had 30 or 40 thousandths of bow in it. 
I literally took it down there, not even knowing much about that machine, and I stuck newspapers under the middle of it just to. So when I turned the magnet on, you know, and I got that thing within a couple thousands. And I think too, it seems to me they don't dress the wheel enough. When it's too shiny, I get worried because I think it's glazing more than it's cutting. It's just me. I, I, they're honing. <laughs> <laughs> So, good point. I used to have a company in town I used to deal with, uh, Pendleton Tool, and they used to do all my blanchard grinding when I had the tool shop, and they did a nice job. They were flat, but it is what it is. Anything else? Well, uh, do you guys enjoy that tonight? Is that all good? You uh, yeah, thanks very much. That was great, yeah. Let me keep, yeah. We're good to keep going with these? All right, give me a, a couple days. This is this will float on Zoom tonight for an hour or so to process it. I'll download it, turn it into a thing, and uh, a, a, a lesson for so you can watch it again. Um, make sure. Uh, I think I'm going to have to do the, the registration each time for now. It's not that hard, is it? It's pretty easy to register for. You'll just get an email from me. I'm actually forming a new list for people who attend, just so I can keep in touch with you guys. Um, any questions? email me. I know some of you guys had suggestions. For those of you who have your own favorite tools or ideas, send them to me. I start working. I'm so glad I didn't decide to do this every week. I do it every two weeks and, and that, that keeps me busy enough. If, every week might be too much. So as long as sometime next week I get some ideas or, or some pictures you want to show off or something you built, we could do show and tell. I have no issues with any of that. This is kind of a, a, a club we're building together. It's, start, it's fun to start seeing some of the same faces again. So um, we shall go from there. So as I said last week, though, uh, it is always an honor and a privilege for me to train people and to share my knowledge and to meet guys from around the country uh, that love this trade, too. So it's uh, a lot of fun for me, too. So uh, I guess that's it from uh, Erie PA. Did anybody uh, get the message about the monkey? Does anybody want to know about the monkey? Did anybody? I was just going to ask about the monkey. <laughs> Well, I logged on. The uh, uh, the year was 1969, and I, it, it was a dark and stormy night. Well, my father had passed away, and I was nine years old. And uh, my brother had just gotten married, I think, just before my father passed away, and he bought a house. So uh, my father had passed away. And my brother said that my brother was a very jumpy guy. He's a really good toolmaker, but he's very jumpy. He said, why don't you sleep over at the house tonight? Well, okay, I'm nine. I'm, you know, it's different. You know, go out. I was just sleeping out sometimes with the Boy Scouts or the Cub Scouts. But, that, but all right, so I go over to this house. Well, that night was a very stormy night. There was all sorts of tornado warnings going off. And my brother said, Philip, he used to call me Philip. He said, nothing to worry about as long as the sky doesn't turn red. Well, within 30 seconds, the sky turned beet red. <laughs> so now... <laughs> His neighbor calls up. I hear him talking to Ed next door. He says, yeah, come on over. Yeah, he says, if we're all going to die, we might as well die together. And I'm nine. I'm hearing all this, right? <laughs> so Ed lives, Ed lives 50 feet away, and Ed drove over. All right? So I, finally, it's time for bed, and it's, it's bad outside. Well, I get in this bed I've never been in, this room I've never been in. Well, about a week or two before that, I had just watched The Wizard of Oz for the first time. And uh, in the middle of this one gigantic lightning strike, I look up and that monkey was hanging in the window. And I thought, <laughs> I thought one of the monkeys from the Wizard of Oz had found me and was going to eat me, and take me back to the queen or whatever, the wicked witch. So I screamed. Well, a few years ago, five years ago, my brother passed away. And when I was going through the house, I, I saw the monkey and I had to just, I had to have it. So that's, that's my big, big monkey story. And it doesn't scare me anymore, but it scared the living hell out of me that one night <laughs> many years ago. So that's it. So again, honor, privilege to talk to you guys. We'll see you in two weeks. Suggestions, pictures, anything, questions, get a hold of me and we'll go from there. Okay. Yep. Great. Thank you so Thanks. much. Okay. Thanks. You're very Thanks. welcome. And that's it from Erie, Pennsylvania. Yeah, thanks, Phil. Good night, guys. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Stay well, everyone. Yeah, everybody stay safe.